into it this time. Uh, so I'm here again, like yesterday, with Milo Rao, with the writer Edouard Louis, who is also an actor now. I forgot to mention that yesterday. Absolutely. Uh, and with the philosopher Geoffroy de la Gannerie, uh, and to discuss the aesthetics of resistance. So yesterday we discussed the roots of left-wing activism in your lives and whether or art is a form of activism. Uh, in a way. Um, and we ended with some thoughts on the traditional separation between theory and arts, with Milo saying that to him, Edouard's books are also theoretical works. So Edouard, I, was, I think Milo was hoping that you would say a few words about that, about how you consider your own works in that sense and whether that, that resonates with you. Yeah. I mean, uh, thank you very much, Laura. Uh, the thing is, um, for me, the, the question is, uh, is, is of course, like blurring the traditional borders between art and theory and literature and everything. But the question is not uh, exactly the question of theory. It's the question of uh, explicit and explicitation. And yesterday we have been talking about confrontation as one of the cornerstone to kind of renew uh, the artistic uh, gesture and to kind of uh, try to make art more radical. And I think that one of the other cornerstones of this, of this revolution that we are hoping for and of this change would be uh, not only confrontation, but explicitation. And this is really what I'm trying to do in, 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 in my books and what Geoffroy is doing since he's writing theory and what also Milo is bringing, the new things that he's bringing also in, in, within the theater. I think that in the past, uh, literature has been structured by um, the fact uh, and the desire of saying uh, not too many things, you know? And I had the impression that when I, I started to write, the less you would say in a book and the more you, be, you would be recognized, uh, literary speaking and artistically <laughs> speaking, you know? As if the, the, the best review you could get from a literary critique would be, this book is wonderful because it suggests everything and it says nothing, you know? It's not explicit, mm. it's not didactic, it's not pornographic. Uh, it's just like everything is suggested and nothing is said. And we can like uh, challenge and question this uh, historical rule of literature. Uh, why is it suddenly considered something positive within the literature to, to, to not speak? Where, where does it come from? And I think it's deeply linked uh, to the interconnection between the bourgeoisie and the literature, because as we were saying yesterday, the bourgeoisie knows the world, the dominant class knows the world, they know how bad the world is, they know how violent the world is, and they don't want to know it, you know? And so they prefer to suggest it in order to never be completely uh, uh, confronted to it, you know? So as if in the past there was an aesthetic values of not saying the things, there was an, an aesthetic values of, of, of creating metaphors and creating only suggestion. And when you read, for example, the, 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 the journal, the diary of, of André Gide, uh, it's, it's, it's incredible to read that uh, André Gide wanted to say things, but in his diary he always say, I shouldn't say it, I should just try to find a character that would character. evoke this idea, that would inspire this idea, but I would never see this idea. And I think what I'm trying to what I'm trying to do now, and what also Milo in the artistic field is doing, and it's really related to theory and to what Jofa was saying about the explicit that contains theory, that theory contains, that 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 a, a, a literature that would be radical today is a literature that would uh, or, or not or theatre that would say what it says at the moment uh, of, of of you know of the and the, and and in fact the the, the the whole history of the dominant class and the whole story of the of the bourgeoisie is to always uh, hide uh, reality as it is. You know, Pierre Bourdieu says that when the bourgeoisie uh, eat, they create a ceremony in order to hide that they are eat that they are eating for physiological reason. Where they put a coat, they always pretend that it's only for aesthetic reason and not to get hot, and not to get cold. So you always have to hide, you know, the reality of the thing you are doing and also, or, 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 always like hiding the things that you are doing. And I think that to make an explicit art and to make an explicit literature, to say what, to, 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 to say what you do at the moment you do it, it's, it's fundamentally anti-bourgeois art. And, and from that regard, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a radical art. 
If I want to say that my father was destroyed by a class system, I say it. I don't suggest it, you know. If I say that Nicolas Sarkozy or Emmanuel Macron made political decisions that destroyed my father's body, I'm not going to suggest it in inventing a fake character, in inventing a fake politician. I say it, you know. If I say that the world of my childhood was homophobic, I write it. I don't suggest it. I say in my books the world of my childhood was homophobic and it was willing to destroy people like me. And, and, and for me, this is really, um, yeah, something that is going, that, that is going on in, also in, in Milo's, in Milo theater. And, uh, I wonder how you, you think about it, Milo, and, and what is your views on it? But, but clearly it's, uh, I think one of the things that we share and that we share automatically with Geoffroy, because in a way theory is the art of the explicit. So, so, so it's, 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 re it's related. Yeah, I, I perhaps I can I can shortly answer on it or some thoughts I had uh, um, on 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 what you're telling me. So for me, the the important thing, but I, I think that uh, the neoliberal rhetorics or the bourgeois rhetorics of the non-explicit, of the trigger warnings, of the safe spaces, of this impossibility to go to an art space and look into the face of. Of, of the reality of the violence of our economic global system. This is very typical for the whole bourgeois era, but especially, I think, for now, and the idea of purity in art. Mm -hmm. So I, I would, I would, I would uh, state that what we are doing is somehow an art of the impure, using the power of the pureness of the radicality. But what we do as an act in the art field is impure. So I, what, my... Impression is the more you deny radicality in the rhetorics you use in the real world, so to say, somehow the more you create fictive worlds where nobody really is appearing, they are super, extremely violent. So, I mean, that's, that's a bit, the, let's say, dialectics of the emotions in, in, the, in the neoliberal age. And what, for me, is the important that we link in arts the violence of the real and how we translate it explicitly into the space of the, or the parallel space of the unreal. So we had yesterday, two days ago, no, two days ago, before yesterday, uh, our common friend Thomas Ostermeyer was here and it was quite interesting because at one moment he was saying, we have to be in the, in the, in the rehearsal space, but we also have to be on the, on the street. So now uh, the artist has to be in both spaces. And it was translated in the press because then it was an article about it and they translated it now we can't stay in the art space anymore, we have to be on the street. And I think it's exactly the parallelity of these two worlds, what it is all about, you know, when while being art is not denying the negativity of art by the positivity of activism, but bringing it, bring it together and talking about the difficulties of this, of this, of this crazy mix what you do when yeah. you are kind of changing art by using reality to do so and vice versa. Now, I wanted to ask you about that because that involves, of course, as you've done in the past, highlighting the lives of others, the real lives of others in, in your cases, whether it's through writing or on stage by highlighting what's happening behind the scenes and what the actors are going through. So how do you, as, as artists, how do you ensure that the people you're working with still have agency in that process? Um, who should uh, uh, answer first? Uh, Edouard, do you, uh, do you yeah. want to start? Perhaps writing about people, perhaps from that you grew up, that you grew up with, and writing about them from a different position nowadays. Um, I keep thinking about what Didier Ribon wrote about uh, writing about the working class when you're no longer part of it, in a sense, and that that tension. Um, how do you approach that and approach the agency of the people that you're writing about? Uh, I mean, I'm not interested in agency. <laughs> it's really, <laughs> <Okay>. it's really <laughs> not a, it's really, it's really not a, not a, I don't say that it doesn't exist or that there are no like rooms in people's lives sometimes to, to achieve things. But I, when I write what I, what I find in, important and interesting and, and is the, to see the situation where people's agency is being destroyed and the possibility mm -hmm. of dreaming, of choosing, of making decision is suddenly destroyed, being destroyed by a situation. 
and um, there is always there is always a conservative risk for me in the rhetoric of uh, agency because if you say people always have agency and if you say people always have room for choice uh, no matter the situation then you make people responsible for what they are what does it mean it means that if a if a factory worker didn't study it's his fault because he didn't have he had he had energy and he didn't use it i mean if people are uh, destroy and depressed, they kind of chose it at some point because they had ag agency and they didn't use it. And um, that isn't, for that me, is it was not extremely... what, Just to say that is not what I meant. No, 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 of course. No, no, of course. I'm, I'm elaborating on, on what you say. But, but precisely, I think it's an important issue. I know it's not what you are saying, but I think it's. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, the, the, I, I'm, I'm precisely thinking that when I, when I, when I published um, uh, Who Killed My Father, about, my, mm. about the life of my father uh, growing up uh, in a working class family with an alcoholic mm. father. Uh, stopping school at 14 years old, like his father and his father before him, going to work to the factory, then being destroyed by an accident at the factory and being in bed for years and being destroyed by French politics and the violence of French politics against uh, poor people. There were some, and I know obviously that you are not part of it, but it's just like walk this in inside me. It, it walk it up inside me. Mm -hmm. There were some like very bourgeois critics telling me uh, he's denying the agency of his father. And mm. for me, the, this reaction was extremely violent uh, towards mm. me and towards my father, because it, what does it mean? It means that if we say my father had agency, it means that he deserved what he got, that he didn't use this agency, that he didn't use this liberty. So I think that there are some lives that are radically uh, uh, destroyed in terms of agency. They are completely destroyed in terms of choice. And I don't think that it's the whole reality. I don't think it's everyone. I don't think it's mm. everybody. But they are the lives I want to talk about. And I, I leave the bourgeoisie with, with the little agency, but uh, and they can do whatever they want. But as soon as I write, I'm, 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 I'm not into it. And uh, it's strange because in the now in the in the in the field of the left. Um, mm. Some people pretend that it's more radical to pretend that people always have agency, you know, as if you were violent or conservative in, in saying that people have not. But what is, what, is, what is violent is to pretend that people always have and that they could have made a choice that they didn't make. And uh, this, is, this is what I really want to, to, to understand. And that's why, like, I, I know that it's not what you were saying, but the word agency is completely outside my brain. It's outside my mind because it's uh, no. That makes a, that makes a lot of sense, but it's really interesting at the same time because because someone's agency has been destroyed. I suppose there's that tension of you're in the position of writing about it and about them about something that perhaps they can't write about themselves, um, and that's. There is tension there, even if it's not necessarily tied to <laughs> to the issue of whether or not you're taking away their agency. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, but but also it's it's a, for me it's a, it's a it's a good thing. It's a good thing that when you cannot mm. speak, uh, other people do it for you. And I I was in the same yeah. position at some point of my life. There was some some point in my life where I was uh, uh, hopeless, speechless, where I was a gay working class boy, mm. and some people were talking on my behalf. And I would, I was, I wouldn't have been able to talk if they didn't talk for me at my place mm. at some point. And that gave me the strength at some point to to talk. So, so it's not for me. It's never an abuse to write on behalf of someone. It's it's opening the mm. possibility for the other people to talk. But but it's a it's a good thing that that we have people who talk for us and in our place when we cannot talk. For me, it's a, it's the most beautiful thing. And uh, so I don't, yeah. Um. Now, Geoffroy, I'd love to have your reaction perhaps because you've also worked with, with activists by writing books with them, with Assad Traoré, for instance. How does that come into your work, the idea of perhaps working with someone else and helping them get to the platform that they want to achieve or at least further their, pl their platform by working with them? I mean, I, um, it's true, like, like Edouard, I don't uh, recognize myself into the category of agency or even in the notion of uh, 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 give people a voice or represent the voice of the voiceless and so on. I think that when we engage in a, in a, a theoretical project, uh, precisely me, when I write, it's to fight 
or to fight against uh, the the the, the pre-constructed um, discourse uh, people use to understand themselves. So, and for example, I wrote about Edward Snowden, Julian Assange. Edward Snowden said he was a patriot or said he was a, a, in the tradition of civil disobedience. And I wrote my book about uh, him and Julian Assange and Sarah Harrison and Chelsea Manning. I tried to show precisely uh, how they were in, uh, in another position than uh, another situation that of civil disobedience. As they are inscribed in other political traditions. They try to invent a new way of doing politics. Uh, when Assa Traoré emerged in France as one of the most important voice today of the anti-racist and anti-police movement. Uh, sometimes she uses words of category that uh, uh, like police brutality, like uh, discrimination and so on, that I thought uh, were uh, problematic if you want to understand the reality of the uh, racial and police uh, system uh, in France and in the US. And so I, I think that the, the role of the theoretician is not to give a voice, it's precisely to, to, um, to deconstruct all the categories we of, we use spontaneously to understand ourselves, <clears throat> but these categories are part of the system that produces us as subject, subjectivity to the power, and so we think we think ourselves, but we are still thinking uh, uh, um, thoughts by the system when we use them. And so the role of the theoretician is to make a rupture with that kind of uh, discourse in order to produce and to radicalize uh, wow. the way people think about their situation. Sometimes I. I tend to, to define myself as a, a uh, radicalizer, uh, to, 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 to make people become more radical in their way of thinking, more systematic, mm -hmm. uh, more pure. And I was very struck by, by, by what uh, Milo said about the notion of impurity, because I remember when I, I discussed with him or with artists, in fact, or with Thomas Ostermeyer, they always use the category of being uh, not pure. <laughs> uh, art is about being mixed, uh, not too systematic, to understand the contradiction of life, uh, um, to be in the side of uh, it's not clear, uh, it's, it's complicated and so on. And it's true that, for, for example, in my work, I often precisely say that uh, theory is much more a, a quest for purity, you know? Uh, it's a kind of, uh, of drive to uh, try to destroy what we think as contradiction, what we think as impure, what we think as uh, uh, complicated, in order to um, recreate a coherence, you know, and to recreate the systematic aspect of life that we perceive spontaneously as impure or complicated, or, and so on and so forth. And so I think that sometimes this kind of, uh, it's, it's not narcissistic, but it's a, a pleasure of impurity for me, to be honest, I always see that as a way of stopping um, uh, reflection, you know, because uh, impurity is always, for me, uh, a lack of systematic thinking or uh, being more in the, uh, <laughs> of the realm of appearances than of the, the reality of the, of, the, of, the, of the society. And that's why when, uh, you know, you speak about the, the issue from the re rehearsal room to go to the street and so on, I think it's very important. I had an idea listening to you. I said um, it's very important to establish connection, of course, between art and politics. But what is most important now is perhaps the fact that uh, politics become more and more an, an artistic practice. You know? It's not the fact that artists are more politish, politically engaged, but more and more what we see is that uh, activism is um, is becoming a kind of artistic practice or it's more, to, it's more, it's more and more about a representation of what's self uh, acting and not uh, real action. People go to the street, they take photo and they go back home. And so they don't really act politically, but they, they give an image of themselves as being actors of, um, uh, of political change. And uh, you, more and more, perhaps the, 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 the sphere of politics become a theater. We know we speak, we speak of political actors, we speak of a political scene, you know, and we all the, the our political action are are kind of uh, becoming more and more in the realm of um, of spectacle, you know, of image, and less and less uh, uh, in terms of efficiency, of political efficiency, yeah, I, and that's why I think we have to make um, uh, an opposition between art and politics to be politically effective. I I uh, I, I would like to to. To answer to this, but perhaps I, I was unclear in, in, in what I mean with not pure or impurity. I think purity, what you mean and what I mean with impurity is perhaps even, even the same. So we need the perspective of purity to see the antagonism. Because I think what the question of agency or let's say the, the actual neoliberal career of this, this term is that we would 
create spaces, elitist spaces, where everybody has an agency and all antagonisms are exported to somewhere, to a, to a kind of outside invisibility, you know, like child work. It's just like somewhere else. And in this, in this, in these safe spaces, there's agency for everybody. And I think this is the false purity, or that's the purity I, I actually attack. I want to create, perhaps you could call it, spaces of pure antagonism. <laughs> So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so to say. <laughs> so <laughs> spaces, for example, and I think perhaps it's also a very different work we are doing because you can, when you when you are working collectively uh, on a play, for example, and this play is linked, all the roles are linked as allegorical they might be, if it's Jesus or not. They are for the people playing it. They are completely directly linked to themselves, and everything you talk about them or you don't even say is absent or too present or mixed or, or uh, you have this, all these conflicts are in the rehearsal room or on stage or on a, on a, on a, on a film set are totally present. It's not that I produce something and then sometimes later somebody would react. It's a kind of an ongoing process of, of, of dealing with these antagonisms of exploitation or of, uh, I don't know, uh, different ideas, how you want to model a history or your character, you want to, to be present in it. And for me, there is only w one way out, and that's what we called yesterday solidarity, or it's perhaps more simply to put it, the history we want to tell together. And that we would give something away from ourselves to together tell this history where we appear as a kind of a character. You know, perhaps, you know, the problem when, when somebody is doing television is doing a documentary about you or they send you an interview you made and they cut out like 80 percent. And then you try to find your argument in it. And somehow you, you accept the deal that there is not complete truth, but you kind of. of and that's why for, why for me, theater is interesting and why I try always to find a, a room of extreme impurity. That's why I would prefer the street to the rehearsal room somehow. Or I would try to bring the rehearsal room to the street and mix it together. What we do today evening, that was a project that was attacked so many times because what we did is to bring together actors from Mosul and actors from Europe. And 90% of the discussions about this project is not what we achieved and what we did together, but it is that a white man is flying to, to Mosul. So this is the neoliberal discussion you have about uh, projects of this, because I think all of us, and I include myself, grew up in a system of complete exploitation where everything, every discussion here, who talks more, how can we then use this discussion? I don't know, you know. Uh, we are grew up in a, in a system of exploitation that we can't imagine spaces that try to be non-exploitative. We just can't understand it anymore somehow. And I think art is a way, and now we are very pedagogic saying that symbolic space is where you can be antagonistic, you can be extreme, you can include all differences you might have in your, in your, in your backstory, but at the same time finding a way of telling a story together. So that's the thing I'm, I'm uh, and it sounds very humanist, but I'm, I'm interested in it. To not exclude from the beginning on, for example, we have a lot of artist collectives in, in, in Germany, but these so-called collectives, there are people coming from the same milieu, having made the same school, and then they do theatre together. And what do you expect as outcome from this? I mean, as a Marxist, not a lot, because it's just a repetition of the same. And, uh, and I try to bring together, I don't know, in the projects, and it's very... Uh, yeah, it's very terrorizing and panicking sometimes people that would never meet outside this, this, this frame of, a, of, a, of an art project. I'm sure, I'm sure that's still a complex thing to, to handle when you're doing it in real time, say working in Mosul or with people who are in a completely different position in society or in the global world than, than you are. Have you ever had any ethical doubts or any regrets about the way you've handled some situations or some productions, perhaps Milo, and then I will go back to, to Edouard and Geoffroy or never. <laughs> I can be short. <laughs> I mean, every second night is sleepless for me. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a very ethical person from my character, but I'm confronted to so many contradictions that I'm really, 
Um, and it goes to very simple things. We don't have to talk about different cultures. The time I have in, for example, the opera we made in Geneva, when the, the, mm -hmm. the extras arrive and then you have 20 minutes to say you walk from here to there. I mean, you have to organize sometimes and it's a kind of a dictatorship of the art. And that's for me the most, uh, the most problematic, at the same time, strangely, also the most boring uh, aspect of of kind of making it round, reworking it. And this is, the, for me, the ethically most difficult moment when you want to make it lisible for a third person that was not in the process. And you are very used as an artist and others that are perhaps less used that in the end you have to find this, this kind of form that is reductive, that is redundant, that is boring. So this is, for me, the, the biggest ethical thing. And, of course, the only thing that you can do to fight against it, we will talk this evening about, it is kind of a real outcome. So, for example, mm. in, in Mosul, I hope we, we, we made an application for a UNESCO project that we will build up a film department there, that we bring infrastructure that then is independent, like we did it in the, in the Congo Tribunal. Did you just, like, kind of somehow also sometimes try to really separate the, the artistic work and the, and, the, and the activist work, if it's possible or not, but that, that you have these two lines. Now, I suppose we're very much talking today about strategies for our activism. And I wanted to ask you, Geoffroy, because you said yesterday that to you perhaps all art or all writing is to an extent activism, not necessarily left-wing activism, but activism. Uh, but you also work very regularly with people whose career is in activism rather than in writing or in making art. So how do you, how does that, that relationship develop and how do you find a balance uh, when you work with people whose entire lives is devoted to activism and not necessarily to thinking about it and then writing or making art about it? Well, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's because for me, the I don't know how to say that uh, with being naive, but for me, the goal of life is not to write books, but to change society. So uh, mm -hmm. if I write books, it's never to write books or to publish ideas or to be happy about a book or a good sentence and so on. It's at the end to try to find a way to give tools for people to fight better or to be more effective in order to change the laws or to change culture in which we live. So that's why it's true that, for example, for me, I don't have a lot of uh, aesthetic um, uh, practices. I don't go to museum. I don't really like uh, paintings. I don't like sculpture. I don't go very often to the movie. I go often to the opera because Didier is a big fan of opera. I, lo I love uh, Milo plays and I, I go there very often because it's, it's very different kind of um, uh, experience. But it's true that uh, for me, uh, how to say, the, the, the definition of writing is to, uh, um, to find connections with, uh, with activists and people who fight or want to change mm -hmm. societies. And that's why the, when I write, even when, when it's very abstract, it's a way of uh, being, uh, finding a way to relate to them um, uh, with other things that's just experience or indignation. And so the, the, the goal of life is to change society. And that's why I, I, my connection with activists is, uh, is what is most important for me. Mm -hmm. Edouard, do you, do you feel the same at the moment, say, when you start writing right now, if you start working on the new project, do you think about that dimension of activism at the same time? How do you position yourself as a writer? Yeah, I mean, um, I, started as a, I started as an activist. I, start, I, be, I became an activist when I was uh, 14 years old. And uh, mm -hmm. I kept like being an activist. I was uh, I was a Trotskyist activist in in high school, and then I started to write <laughs> I didn't know uh, that. my books. Larry. Uh, Great. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you about it, Milo. Yes, please. Uh, and uh, then I I started to write, and it was um, a kind of a, a kind of a continuation of a certain uh, of a way I couldn't I couldn't bear the the world that was surrounding me. Really, I was I was born with a with, with a kind of hate for this world and for its ugliness and for its uh, uh, violence. And, uh, you know, you, so if we think in terms of a manifesto for a new art and for a new literature, we talked about confrontation. I, I tried to talk about explicitation and maybe another cornerstone of it would be multiplicity and the fact that when you write as Thomas Ostermeyer was uh, saying yesterday to Milo, you have to be also in the street. 
and you have to be also in contact with the social movements and you have to be also like in so many different places. You can write in the newspapers, you can write your books, you can be in the street, you can do theatre projects with, with other artists, you can go to high school to talk to, talk to, to younger people. And I think like you, if, as Geoffroy said, if the goal is to change the world, this change can be only achieved through this multiplicity of action. Because clearly when you write, you are not, you are not going to reach everybody. For me, it's, a, it's an illusion I had in the past. You know, I was always writing and think like, how could it be possible for the people of my childhood, the working class people, to read my book? And in a way, if we are realistic, they will never read my book because they are working class. If they start reading them, it's because they are not working class anymore. And because precisely our society works like in terms of exclusion of the people who have access to culture and the ones who don't have access to culture. So to think like how can excluded people read is a contradiction because if they have access to culture, then they're not excluded anymore. So of course there are like exceptions and like different people within a milieu and you have like ways of sometimes reaching the people. But when I write, I now I don't I don't try to write for the working class. I write I write for my enemies. I write for the bourgeoisie. I write in order to challenge them, to question them, to make feel, to make them feel bad, to ask them why don't you do more? Why don't you fight this world? Why are you reproducing this world? And then if I want to talk to working class people like people like my family or the people I grew up with, then I go in the street. Then I go to high schools and I talk to the people. Mm -hmm. Then I write uh, in the media. Then I do short videos in the media or things like this. But, but if you want to really <coughs> achieve a goal of change, you have, to, you have to practice this multiplicity. Otherwise, you will, you will just reach your enemies. And it's important to reach your enemies because they have the power and you have to challenge them and eventually destroy their way of thinking and their way of being. But, 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 but it doesn't like it's so many things at the same time, and uh, it's not it's not in just writing that you will do it. And that's why with with Geoffroy we we have been demonstrating, we have been writing with Asad Traoré, uh, we have been uh, mm. demonstrating with the Yellow Vest, writing about it. Like I will, it will not be achieved uh, through a book, and it's not possible. But when you write a book, you have the possibility of doing all those things together. And for me, if you are a writer and you never go in the street. Uh, it's a shame. It's a shame. It's uh, it's it's impossible. Now we've come up upon conflict and antagonism in this conversation, and I feel like the horizon <coughs> in all three of you for all three of you is in a way a form of a new utopia, a new a new way of rebuilding from the left and from progressive politics. Now the question being, how do you how do you create a common aim or a common project that is going to override that sense of conflict, including on the left. Uh, we don't have much time left, but I was wondering if, if one of you wanted to perhaps say a few words about that question of the utopia, the goal. So <laughs> far, <laughs> <laughs> the last word is for will... you. In, in for... one minute. Easy. Yeah, in, in one, one minute. minute. <laughs> For me, now, I think I don't believe in the notion of a common aim. I think that uh, mm -hmm. struggles are plural and we have to find the singularity on, of every fight in order to achieve them and to radicalize them. And for me, more and more, I think that the left should be based on something uh, what I call the vitalism, which is to say which, mm -hmm. which are the force that want to destroy life or to mutilate life or to end life of people precarious uh, uh, more, uh, more than others. And we have to, uh, to develop the forces of, of life, of health, of uh, uh, being in a, a good shape, not endangered and so on. And so I would say that the multiplicity of struggles and a kind of vitalism uh, could be the basis of, uh, of the renewal of the left form. I can explain that tomorrow if you want you. Yes. And I don't believe in the category of neoliberalism. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, have time, we'll, have, we'll have time to elaborate, and I apologize for the difficult question at the very last minute. <laughs> okay, but, thank, but thank you so much for taking a crack at it. Uh, thank so you we'll much. be back tomorrow at 4 p.m. to thank continue you. that discussion. And if you want to stick around, there is a very, I think, interesting discussion at 5 p.m. following our session about the question around the following question Can there be global arts with the Brazilian choreographer Lia Rodriguez, the director Wajdi Mouawad, and the Lebanese playwright and visual artist Rabim Roué? 
and Orestes in Mosul, if I'm not mistaken, tonight Absolutely. at 7 p.m. since we've discussed it. Thank you so yeah. much for following Wonderful. along and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> ciao, ciao. Oh, bye. 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 <laughs> Avashti's already there. <laughs> <laughs>